On February 22nd, in, at the Roslyn Institute in Edinburgh, Scotland, a team of scientists claim they have discovered the technique to clone mammals. Uh, it is a bizarre story. This sheep named Dolly appeared on the cover of Time magazine, March 10th, 1997 edition, and one of the articles uh, was headlined, The Age of Cloning. A line has been crossed, and reproductive biology will never be the same for people or for sheep. Gary Stearman is here to discuss with me this subject of cloning. And the subject of cloning, J.R., raises moral and ethical questions. Uh, the Scottish reaction, this, since this was done in Edinburgh, uh, went something like this, as uh, written about in the European of 27 February. Uh, and the article that they write opens this way. 27 years ago, in a book on medical ethics, the theologian Hans Tielicke asked, and I quote, is there something about man that dare not be changed? Something in his very nature that dare not be violated if he is to remain human? Dr. Donald Bruce, director of the Church of Scotland's Society, Religion, and Technology Projects, said the idea of producing exact copies of ourselves was repugnant. And he said, God created people unique, and cloning would be against the basic dignity of human life. End quote. Uh, there's a lot of worry. And I guess the big question is, has God's law been violated? And, and when you first ask the question, it may not seem so at this point, but we're going to investigate cloning, the implications thereof, and what Scripture has to say about cloning. It's interesting to me, Gary, that the announcement was made at the Roslyn Institute that is in Edinburgh, Scotland. Because you see, for many centuries, it has been believed that the Holy Grail was buried somewhere in the Roslyn Chapel at the Roslyn Castle in Edinburgh, Scotland. Mm, that's right. And this institute is named for the Roslyn Castle. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Holy Grail, of course, is that cup out of which Christ drank at the Last Supper, this, this um, cup that holds eternal life, this, this cup that renews youth. And uh, a whole legend has been built up uh, through from medieval Europe to this present day around the idea that one can, if one can find this cup, then they can drink from it and obtain eternal life mm -hmm. and cures for all sicknesses, sure. et cetera, et cetera. And it's bizarre to me that at the Roslyn Institute, this fountain of youth this um, reproduction for uh, continuing life into um, eternity, shall we say, was made. Fountain of youth or depraved experiment. You know, J.R., we can go back to Genesis 6 and see uh, God's view of genetic tampering. In Genesis 6, <clears throat> it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that uh, he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in 120 years. And the next sentence, J.R., there's this amazing statement. Verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And theologians have said for years that there was a corrupting of the human race at this point, an intervention from on high. Uh, some kind of uh, bizarre genetic manipulation went on that produced a race <clears throat> of giants, the Nephilim. And later on, they're called the Rephaim, and we can talk about them in a few minutes. But uh, God then was put into a position, He was forced into a position to judge humanity mm -hmm. on the basis of this genetic tampering. And this reminds me of what's going on today. It brought on the flood of Noah, didn't it? Absolutely. Now, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. 
So this very idea of cloning could certainly be a prophetic sign of the soon coming of Jesus Christ. It really could because now that science has made this breakthrough, what can't they do? You know, cloning on first examination doesn't seem to be that uh, too different from in vitro fertilization. With in vitro fertilization, you combine sperm and egg in a dish, you culture them until they form an embryo, and then you implant them in a womb and they are delivered normally. In cloning, uh, you basically take a body cell, such as a skin cell, and through a couple of manipulations, you inject the nuclear material into an enucleated egg cell, and then with a little electrostimulation, you cause that egg cell to begin dividing so that it then produces an embryo, which is an exact copy of the original nucleus, and when the embryo uh, then is mature, it is injected into a, a womb where it is delivered normally like any other baby. And so essentially, uh, cloning is not too much different from in vitro fertilization. So you can say, well, what's really so wrong with it? Is it really a violation of God's law? But on second thought, a clone is asexual reproduction. That is, it, it's, it's reproduction without the required mother and father or male and female parents. So you can clone a female and get a female offspring, clone a male, get a male offspring, but it's asexual reproduction. And JR, I have thought about this and to me, this is a violation of God's law. You know, it's kind of interesting that um, various uh, hypotheses have been put forth by the scientific community mm -hmm. for making these clones. And um, all of these hypotheses that they've come up with appear to be uh, humanitarian. For example, on an article entitled, Will We Follow the Sheep? The Time article says, uh, Midwestern parents um, are at a clinic who have flown in specially to see if the lab can make them an exact copy of their six-year-old daughter recently found to be suffering from leukemia, so aggressive that only a bone marrow transplant can now save her. Now, can you imagine the possibilities here? If we just did it for her, mm -hmm. you know, that would, uh, that would be a wonderful thing, yeah. uh, humanity thinks. But you have opened Pandora's box here. You have stepped beyond the realm of of human ingenuity into God's realm. And uh, this is, this is uh, something specifically that God uh, deals with, this making of human beings. And mm. so I think it's uh, certainly across the threshold. It verges on uh, the creation of a monster. And in fact, uh, the Frankenstein monster uh, nightmare it might actually become realized because J.R. Science operates incrementally. It never stops. It's yes. never satisfied. Once having conquered a certain step, say cloning, then what's the next step? Well, the next step might be to produce a slightly improved version of the species. Mm -hmm. A little stronger, a little more intelligent, combining genes that would make a, a super a human being, a, perhaps a whole race of same. Mm -hmm. uh, and it wouldn't be long before science might say, you know, let's produce a whole new species of hum humankind and call it human mark II or something. In other words, the production of a new species would clearly a, be a violation. A slave of, class. A slave class, yeah. Mm -hmm. People who are strong with weak minds, force them to work so that you can make more money. Such a thing is not beyond the pale. It's easy to imagine men doing these things yes. if they have the capability, which now they do. Yeah, now we can imagine a copy of this six-year-old girl for a bone marrow transplant, but what about a heart transplant? Right. You know, killing the clone to harvest the organs. Um, this sort of thing is just one step. One step away. See? And it's the same procedure. Let's take abortion, for example. A lot of people thought, because over the years the news media has uh, promoted the idea, um, the life of the mother is at stake. It's for her sake that we're going to have to kill this child growing inside of her. Uh, when, as a matter of fact, it's a matter of convenience. 
99% of the abortions today are just the killing of the babies as a matter of convenience. Mm. That's incredible. Isn't and it? using the genetic material from the aborted babies. Yeah. yeah. In the Time article, the process of cloning is explained through these various diagrams. In uh, plate number three, it says the two cells are placed next to each other and an electric pulse causes them to fuse together like soap bubbles. A second pulse mimics the burst of energy at natural fertilization, jump-starting cell division. Oh. Shades of Frankenstein. Shades of Frankenstein. I can, I can see the monster with the lightning bolts coming down, you know. All this is really scary. You know, the process you mentioned, J.R., is mentioned practically identically in a book published in 1978 by Lippincott entitled, In His Image, The Cloning of a Man. <clears throat> Author David M. Rorvik is a medical journalist, and before he wrote this book, he had written many other books on the field of fertility and conception, uh, such as uh, Your Baby's Sex, Now You Can Choose, uh, Choose Your Baby's Sex, The Sex Surrogates, Brave New Baby, The Promise and Peril of Biological Revolution. So he was very familiar with the subject. Mm -hmm. Then he wrote this book, nonfiction, he says, uh, to chronicle the story of a very wealthy man with an unlimited means who came to him because of his connections in the uh, world of genetic research and said, I want you to find me a scientist who will clone me. The 20 years ago. This is 25 years ago now. <clears throat> the, the, a very wealthy industrialist came to David Rorvik and said, I want you to find someone who can clone me because I have no heir and I want a male heir and I want him to be just like me and I've got unlimited money. And this book chronicles the cloning? Chronicles the cloning. Uh, they uh, obtained a surrogate mother. They told her that she would be bearing the child of uh, anonymous parents. She didn't know she was bearing a clone. According to the book, published in 1978, the, this human clone was born. A year later, it tested perfectly, and genetic tests revealed that it was indeed this man's clone. And what amazes me about the book is that it's like reading today's newspaper, because the process they used in this book, published in 1978, was identical to the one you just read about in Time magazine, 1997. Mm. 20 years have gone by. Now, J.R., 20 so, years does not go by in science without there being advancements made of various kinds. Uh, so this technique was around in 1978 and before. And before. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Incredible. Now, this young man would be how old now? Mm, around 20. Uh, but the date of his birth is, is veiled. The book uh, goes to great lengths to keep the identities of everyone secret. Mm -hmm. uh, but apparently this clone, if this is a true story, and I, I suppose it is, uh, this clone would be around 20 years of age right now and be, be inheriting the father's fortune. Is this or, book available today? Uh, no, it's not. This book was pulled off the market and is very, very difficult to get. In fact, it, you can't find it in libraries. wonder why. I wonder why. <laughs> I don't know why. The ethical questions, of course, must have been uh, addressed back then and they decided were. Uh, perhaps by the publisher to pull the book. It's very possible this is the case. Whatever the case, uh, reading this gave me the cold feeling. Uh, the hair raised up on the back of my neck as I realized if this could be done 20 years ago, what are they doing secretly and surreptitiously today? Because this is the way genetic science operates. Uh, they have a, a stealth mentality in the world of genetic research because all this is patentable. Every one of these processes can make millions for the patent holder. And there's almost a war going on uh, between labs in China, Russia, Canada, the United States to see who can be first with various genetic processes which can then be patented, perhaps later sold for millions, or used to control massive uh, chemical or phar pharmaceutical industries. So, so we've got something going on here which is secret, surreptitious, it's amoral, uh, very probably a violation of God's law, and it'll result in a monster. And I'm and reading here in Deuteronomy uh, 2 and 3 uh, concerning Israel's entry into the Promised Land, J.R., they ran into some giants, so-called. Uh, for example, in Deuteronomy 2.20, uh, 
uh, that also was accounted, uh, the land of the Ammonites, uh, as a land of giants. Giants dwelt therein in old time, and the Ammonites called them Zamzumims. It goes on to describe these so-called so Zamzumims, who are a class of the giants called Rephaim. Uh, they were instructed to destroy uh, Og, the king of Bashan, and his pro uh, progeny, uh, called Rephaim. If you go over to 2 Samuel, speaking of Gath, there was a battle in Gath where a man was of great stature that had on every hand six fingers, on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number. And he also was born to the giant. We know what happened to the giants. Jonathan slew that particular giant. David slew Goliath. Uh, the idea of having six fingers and six toes, 24 digits, is to me the idea of a genetic monstrosity. Mm -hmm. uh, um, some kind of uh, species that God did not want to exist. Those are not around today. They were destroyed. That's how God feels about these genetic monsters. When the news of cloning the sheep uh, came to light, President Clinton called for a subcommittee to review the ethics. And of course, there, there's been a lot in the news about whether or not it is ethical. Mm -hmm. And um, it comes down on whether or not one is religious, whether one believes in God. Those who do not believe in God think it's just fine to clone. And those who believe in God, no matter what their other beliefs might be, or whether, uh, whether liberal or conservative in theology, they, they still are against the concept or the idea of cloning, uh, whether it be animal or man. The idea of asexual reproduction, in other words, normal reproduction involves the union of sperm and egg. The resultant uh, offspring then has the combined characteristics of the parents, and God has carefully designed that to produce progeny that are acceptable to Him. If, on the other hand, you trick a skin cell into multiplying and forming a new being, mm -hmm. I don't think God ever had that in mind. You've got technically what is technically definable as a monster. One of the interesting parts of the uh, article uh, discusses the possibility that a clone might not live as long as the, the mm -hmm. item it is cloned from. Uh, for example, does the DNA inside a human being say that we should live somewhere between 70 and 120 years, and if at the age of 60 you clone this fella, mm -hmm. will his clone live six, uh, 70 to 120 years, or will it live 10 years to 40 years, mm -hmm. you see? And uh, this, uh, this brings up an interesting question. Uh, Jewish theologians for centuries have said that Adam was to live a thousand years and he died at the age of 930 and therefore his progeny uh, lifespan is set at 70. Is it possible that his DNA then was encoded for that particular time and yeah. we are simply carrying out uh, the original code? It's possible. You know, JR, as we, we're running very low on time, but there is a, an arch demonic future uh, story given in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 13, verse 15, speaking of the beast out of the earth, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Could that image of the beast be a copy, a clone? I wonder. I, I don't know, but I, I can either. tell you this. The very idea that it would be an image of the beast given life yeah. uh, lends to a lot of possibilities. We do not know how that prophecy is going to come to pass. But the very idea that, you know, it's, it's been in this generation, not in any past generation, That's that right. in vitro fertilization has been developed and also cloning. Right. So we have opened Pandora's box and this world may see some really bizarre things, half human, half pigs, for example. And Paul Harvey reported a few years ago on his broadcast, his uh, noon broadcast, that such a thing had been born in India. Um, the idea of half human, half animal of any kind mm -hmm. uh, is frightening. 
It's, it's not only really frightening, but to me it's blasphemous. It flies right in the face of the fact that we were created in God's image and likeness, and we're supposed to live up to His holiness. In a Time CNN poll, 91% of those interviewed said if they had the chance, they still would not clone themselves. 74% of those interviewed said it is against God's will to clone human beings. And 65% of those interviewed said the federal government should regulate the cloning of animals. Interesting, Gary. And the question before the House, uh, and time, by the way, asked this in, the, in this particular issue, uh, will we follow the sheep? Isaiah 53, 6 says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And that, in a strange way, describes this. Turning to your own way means uh, taking creation into your own hands and creating uh, what I think are monstrosities, J.R., and I do not believe we should follow the sheep. Fascinating. Yeah. Jesus Christ is our only hope for eternal life. He is the Creator, and we would do well to trust in Him. I pray that you will. This is J.R. Church and Gary Stearman. Until next time, keep looking up. Prophecy in the News is a viewer-supported ministry sponsored by our many friends across America and in your area. For a free complimentary copy of the magazine, call our offices directly at 1-405-634-1234 or write to Prophecy in the News, P.O. Box 7000, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma 73153.